Hello and welcome to the Innovation Book Club, the podcast that makes sense of the big ideas that drive creativity and innovation. We're your hosts, Alex Drago and Weiss Bassard, and we believe that while there's never been a greater need for new ideas, perspectives and solutions, understanding exactly what innovation is and how it works has never been more difficult or confusing. So our purpose for this podcast is clear. In each episode, we take an important text from the innovation field, deconstruct it, and then talk through the key ideas to help you develop a more innovative mindset. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the third industrial revolution uh, of Jeremy Rifkin. Um, this is a book uh, he wrote uh, in 2011 and for this podcast we will use the documentary uh, made by Vice where Jeremy Rifkin uh, gives a talk about the third industrial revolution. It's called uh, uh, a radical new sharing economy. Right. Before going into the topic itself, maybe some uh, notes about uh, Jeremy itself. Mm-hmm. So Jeremy Rifkin is an American economic, uh, economic and social theorist, writer, public speaker, and political advisor, and activist. He's the author of about uh, 21 books uh, about the impact of scientific and technological changes on the economy, workforce, society, and environment. Um, some of his famous uh, books uh, he wrote uh, is uh, the, Great, the Green New Deal, for example which is about why the fossil fuel civilization will collapse by 2028 and the bold uh, economic plan to save life on Earth. That's a big idea. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Interesting uh, subtitle, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The majority of his ideas are bold, I must say. Um, Another book of him is The Zero Marginal Cost Society, uh, which is about how the emerging Internet of Things is speeding us to an era of nearly free goods and services. Uh, the Third Industrial Revolution is another book of him, of his, uh, which is uh, what we are going to talk about uh, today. The fourth one is the Empatic uh, Civilization. is about the empatic evolution of the human race and the profound ways it has shaped our development, how it decides our fate as a species. And one of his other famous books is the, Re- the European Dream. How the American dream is in decline and how the European dream is in new is the new standard. He's talking about the European lifestyle and why it's more sustainable socially, economically, and environmentally. Have you ever heard of the European dream before? As a European, no. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> I don't know if it's the reason is is that I'm involved within the European dream or I have the European dream, but it's not that like the Americans talk about the American dream. We in Europe and the Netherlands talk about uh, pursuing their European dream. <laughs> right? Did you? <laughs> I, I've never heard of it. And no doubt in Britain they would reject it as some yeah. Brussels-led <laughs> social control or something. But <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What do you think? Is this, is this book on a quest to change the world or this, or Jeremy itself? <laughs> I mean, I must confess I'd never heard of him before until you said, oh, you know, I'll send you a link, have a look at this. So I don't know anything about him, really. Right. I, I, and so I sort, of, I sort of treated the movie, and especially because it was created by Vice, right? It has a very specific... Right audience and agenda vice not necessarily a bad one but it that you know it, it it basically engages millennials right and 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 the format and and so on reflected that right so i wasn't really sure how to take it i mean he's he he's certainly interested in the big problems he recognizes the big problem and I think as we'll go on, he offers quite a condensed but compelling argument about the problems that we actually face, right? why we face them, mm-hmm. and what we can do about them. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. I haven't, I haven't had heard about Jeremy itself until I, 
accidentally came across his uh, video on YouTube. Right. Um, so shall we begin about the podcast? It's uh, about uh, the topic itself. Yeah, let's start. Um, so uh, first of all, in this uh, in this talk, he uh, starts with giving the audience a note, uh, basically a problem. Um, he says that the GB GDP globally is slowing down, um, uh, slowing down, and the reason he gives is that uh, the productivity is declining. All many countries are experiencing that majority of uh, the, the the developed countries he says and uh, the result is uh, that um, these countries are experiencing unemployment uh, very high unemployment and um, he talks about uh, uh, he, he aims at the millennials in his audience and he says that the, all the millennials that are coming in the workforce are experiencing this high unemployment and decrease uh, decline in uh, and in uh, productivity and he then proceeds with saying that the economic economists predict that in the next 20 years, the productivity and growth will be slow. Then he proceeds with an explanation why this problem exists. He points out that the first and the second industrial revolution has benefited many, but also affected many in a negative way. The ones who benefited are the wealthy ones, he says. The, hell, the wealthy ones now have a combined more wealth than half of the whole human race. He says that there is a, something dysfunctional about the way human family is organizing, organizing its economic relations. He then proceeds with another crisis as the result of the second industrial revolution, which he says is the environmental crisis. He proceeds with examples how the environmental crisis isn't going to come or is a theory, but rather it's happening right now. Everyone on earth is experiencing it in one way or another, he says. Uh, it, he calls it uh, a real-time climate change we are experiencing. He uh, gave examples how the growing CO2 emissions by our industrial lifestyle has changed and is still changing the environment. The result is that we have more violent events, such as the violent hurricanes, winter snow, spring floods, and summer droughts. He calls it the new normal, basically. He says that scientists call it the sixth extinction event um, uh, of the human race that we are right now. Basically, he points out that we are all destroying the environment in real time. <laughs> he, <laughs> he calls it terrifying for the future of the human race and especially for the millennials. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, basically, he's saying, right, that we have limited resources. We've wasted those resources. Those resources have created two crises. One is an economic crisis, right? Wealth is uh, centralized towards a very small minority of people. Right. And the second is that that in itself, the way we do that is uh, has a negative impact on the environment. Exactly. Yes. And we're running out of time. That's basically it. <laughs> yeah. But, but I can't keep track of his timelines, right? So it... We're all going to be dead by 2028. That's what we decided <laughs> earlier on. <laughs> yeah, the, and now he's saying true. we've got 40 years to solve it. <laughs> yeah, that's and true. And then in the video he talks about, oh, tw by 2050 we have to have changed. And I'm like, I'm not sure which timeline we're actually <laughs> following. <laughs> that yeah. makes it more terrifying, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, is it in a few years or is it in 20 yeah, years? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. I, I suppose the good thing is, right, if it ends in seven years, you don't have to bother paying your mortgage off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't rely on that. <laughs> no, exactly. But he but he touches uh but he touches definitely the the events that are currently happening around the world. Right. So right. Uh, he, environmental had he he gives a lot of examples of the environmental uh, events that happened in Indonesia, Philippines, whatever it is, were. He gives a lot of events, examples of things we are experiencing right now. Right. So it's not really yeah. a theory of his. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's what I mean. He sort of bring. I found he brought these things together in a way that was, you know, quite quite compelling. Right. And I was thinking this morning, like. Do I buy into it? And I was like, well, it's such a big idea. I mean, what kind of data would you need in order to prove the idea is right? <laughs> I mean, it would yeah. just be such and how many variables are there is almost impossible. So it's sort of a 
it's a story you can buy into i think that's true a combination definitely of a lot of uh, uh scientific disciplines um because when we just uh, uh talked about the most famous books he wrote the green deal the european dream the empathic civilization industrial revolution zero marginal cost i sense like it's uh, through the course of time um, he collected all those insights he gained from all those different areas, like from the beef industry, he protested against the beef industry, the oil industry, or or the industrial revolutions, economic uh, experiences, eventually which led him to such insights, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's right, yeah. It does feel very much like a... Um this is the end of my career. This is the big, this is where it's culminated. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you about it really. I mean, that's kind of how I, how I thought. Um, right. Shall we move on to the first chapter then? Yes. So in this first part chapter, he begins about uh, the great economic revolutions in history. He says that there, that there have been several major economic paradigm shifts and that all of them share a similar uh, characteristic. The characteristics of uh, how three technologies create a new infrastructure to manage power and move economic life. So this is an important um, um, part uh, in his whole talk. He's talking mainly about the manage uh, management of power and the and the and the mobility and the movement of economic life and economic activity. Yeah. So uh, the first technology uh, is within the communication technology and how we manage our economic activity. The second is the new sources of energy to power our economic activity. And the third is the new models of mobility to allow us to more efficiently move the economic activity. Right. Yeah. He, gives, uh, he gives examples how uh, these three common technologies by the first industrial revolution changed our economic life. Uh, so the steam power printing in the UK allowed um, them to mass produce print quickly. Uh, because of this change, it also affected the mainstream source of energy, which was the rise of the coal industry. And finally, the rise of the coal industry affected mobility. They combined the steam engines on the rail and you had the locomotives. Right. So these three cha technologies by, uh, by the first industrial revolution changed our economic lifestyle. Right. So I looked into this, actually. Right. Because I, I was being a bit cynical. Right. I mean, we'll put this out into the world, right? So we have a responsibility to at least cross-reference some of it. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, steam printing press was actually invented by a German, but it was exploited by a British entrepreneur. Right. And and it was the Times newspaper that eventually uh, 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 leveraged it. Right. And I, I was like, well, how much more efficient was it? And it's incredible because I think with the Gutenberg press, right, the original press one, right, the amount of pages you could do was, you know, minuscule, tens of pages an hour. Yeah. And then when they first invent the steam-powered one, I think it's in 1811 or something like that, it's like 200 pages, right? Right. And then within five years or something, it's 2,000 pages an hour. Right through the adoption of steam-powered technology. And I was like, 2,000, that's not actually that much. And I was like, oh, but then you could have multiple printing presses, right, <laughs> before you know it. Yeah. You, you know, you're, you're printing thousands of books or newspapers, you know, an hour or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually a good point because in the same way I questioned uh, it I also myself. So... If if there wasn't if if the the printing press was the mainstream thing, then like was the problem that not a lot of people could read the newspaper or they couldn't weren't able to reach those people uh, because it's a means of communication. And then the steam powered one came, and suddenly they were able to reach more people, or because they were they were able to print more. Or what was really the problem back then? <laughs> well, it's both. So, so the, uh, until until you had a factory system or the industrial revolution, right? right time wasn't an issue. Mm -hmm. you, you know, because people worked in the fields by and large. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so so the 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 idea of productivity was very different. So, at some parts of the year, 
when you're harvesting or when you're planting, you have to work longer hours. Right. But for other parts of the year, then it's not so much, right, because it's maintenance and, you, and you're looking after. I mean, this is agriculture, right? It could be different with animals. But, um, uh, but yeah, by and large, the sun comes up, you go to work, <laughs> sun goes down, you stop working, right? Yeah. When, when people move into the factories, the idea of productivity becomes important because you're paying people. The idea of time becomes important because you're paying people by the hour. Right. or the day, or whatever it is, right? Right. So you have to have a uniform time. But then once you start having regional connectivity, you have to have a uniform time system. Right. So once you invent the railway system, you have to know that the train leaves London Waterloo right. at 10.30 a.m., gets to the next station, Vauxhall, at 10.34 a.m., and so on and so on and so on. Otherwise, what what do you do? You just turn up at the train station and hope for the best. So there has to be some way of, of connecting time together. Right. And because then you have that, that networked system, you, it, it means you need to communicate to other parts of that network. And so that's why they need the telegraph. Right. Because it's the first time you have near instant communication. I mean, it's even though it's only Morse code, yeah, it's just the electrical pulses down the wire. But you don't need that until you have a connected system. You don't have a connected system until you have a rail, railway. You can't have a railway until you have coal. But you don't need coal until there's stuff to distribute along the network. So they do sort of feed into each other. Yeah, and that's why... And that's why he, you know, he's he's saying we need new communication, we need new sources of energy, and we need new transport in order to drive economic activity. And that's what's. I mean, it's a massive, it's a leap, but that's what powers the first industrial revolution, right? But there are other things that the precursors to the Industrial Revolution, which if you ask any historian, it's, it, it is a range of other things as well. Access to finance, a uh, different banking system. Britain imported its banking system from the Netherlands after William and Mary were appointed after a coup in the late 19th, uh, 17th century. Right. You know, the empire and so on and so on and so on. So he's sort of just launching into this, you know, first Industrial Revolution to, to suit his his methods, but he's saying that the, the driver of economic activity is communication, is energy to power, yes. and is new transport to move things around. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm curious whether this is exactly how you say. Has he picked these three, um, these three topics or themes from the industrial revolutions? just to suit his idea or theory, because there are probably many more other uh, topics. So that's why yeah. I'm also a bit skeptical. Yeah, I, I mean, there are, there are huge dominoes that have to fall in order to get to the Industrial Revolution. Exactly. And the fact is that in Britain, those dominoes fell in a certain order first. Mm -hmm. And it's not because Britain is special, it's because of a range of socioeconomic and political activities uh, or cultures that that gave birth to that right. and you know I, th I think i remember watching a series years ago about well why did it happen in britain first and it, and it has to do with all kinds of really complex things you know so so the nature of agriculture and the nature of how land was owned and people are um uh, the aristocratic system the access to finance the fact that you get um, a whole group of people, um, the Quakers who aren't allowed to be politics, they're not allowed to be involved in politics, so they have to become involved in economics instead, right. and so on and so on and so on. And so there's all these sort of things. But his treatise is not about a history of the Industrial Revolution. It's, it's what promotes 
economic activity. Exactly. What what creates economic development? So I suspect if you gave this to an economic historian, they'd be like, "Yeah, it's not that simple." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's also my point. <laughs> exactly, like you say, there's a lot of other factors and a lot of other dominoes that has essentially uh, made created this infrastructure which he talks about. Yeah. And um, and also uh, he proceeds with the second industrial revolution in the U.S. And also there he talks about the new infrastructure based on these three technologies, communication, transport, and uh, and energy. Right. Where um, where the technology, where the communication technology improved by or changed towards the telephone, where where people could communicate almost instantly, instantly basically. Uh, and eventually it de- it's developed further to radio and television and um and the communication in uh, uh technology he says that converged to the new energy source which was the cheap uh, what he called the texas oil which people started uh, uh using more and more and in combination with the cheap oil henry ford changed mobility which is uh m- ford uh, car yeah so Again, he talks about specifically based on these three items. He 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 suits his theory that this new infrastructure was the reason that the economic activity was managed differently. Again, yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. I mean, you're either going to buy into that or not, but you have to draw the line somewhere. And I suppose he's drawn it. in a space that supports his thesis about the third industrial revolution, you know, but there are, there are other people who've done like the people who do well are the people in every industrial revolution are the people who own the, who own the raw materials. So in the first industrial revolution, it was the people who owned the coal, right? <laughs> Did very well out of that right. and the raw yeah. materials in the second industrial revolution. Well, it was the people who owned the oil. Yeah. Uh, and again, the raw materials were the third industrial revolution. It's the people who own the data, right? Yeah. I mean, so you could draw the line there. That's true. If you wanted. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what he doesn't really talk, I mean, he does later on, he talks about access to finance, right? access to markets yeah you know that uh, you know that uh, but i suppose they are maybe the givens i don't know you know but th- yeah i had the same question well you know I've, I've actually you know i've got a history degree i know a bit more about <laughs> the industrial revolution <laughs> than it's just those three things. exactly it's, it's too simplistic yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like to yeah, say. Yeah, to, yeah. Uh, in my opinion, I'm not a historian, but when I read this, it's like uh, when he, when I, I mean, when I heard this, when I watched his video, he explained in such a simple way the first and the second industrial revolution. I, w- I was like, was it really that simple? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, in Britain, for example, um, you know, the the north of Britain has a completely different geographic structure or geological structure to the south of Britain. Right. And so that's one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution took hold in the north of England and not in the south. Right. Because you had access to coal. You had access to, you know, in Sheffield's case, um, uh, uh, raw materials that you could convert into steel. So, you know, there are other things, but you also need an economic system that supports that. So can are the democratic structures strong enough in order to allow people to be able to borrow money on an open market, right? To leverage that, and so on and so on, you know. So there are a lot more things, and he, in in, you know, his example of the second industrial revolution. So well, you know, in America, and you know, we had a national telephone network. Well, before you could even get to the national telephone network, you had to have a better electrical system, which meant you had to adopt Tesla's. ACDC system, which allowed electricity to be passed across um, uh, vast distances, right. because um, uh, the other system, direct current by Edison, meant that that the electricity essentially couldn't be passed beyond a couple of blocks. So you ended up having a power station on every <laughs> sort of street corner in order to power the system. Yeah, right. And of course, in America, there was the railways. True. And it wasn't just oil, it was paraffin as well, and so on and so on and so on. So so it's not like um, 
the first industrial revolution ended and the second <laughs> industrial revolution started, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> There were still railway systems. I mean, and one of the arguments about America is that without the railway system, right. you would end up with different countries potentially. <laughs> yeah. Because you needed you needed a means to connect them. And the railways was that before the motorways was that. So so he is offering a very simplified version of events. But at the same time, we are critiquing a YouTube video made by Vice for millennials that is true <laughs> right it, 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 it is <laughs> it's for public consumption not for approval by the academy that is definitely true yeah that is definitely true you know but it's still mm. i mean it still stands right up until the internet the main communication methodology was was phone calls and the way we got around was a road network that's true and we needed oil to to get to get around to power that system. Yeah, that we can't argue with that. Definitely, that was th those are the facts that definitely have to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But the point of that is that is that that system in and of itself is giving birth to two sort of monsters, and one is economic deprivation. So you end up with a handful of people at the top owning an enormous amount. And the people, most of the people at the bottom owning nothing, and that is getting worse. And then the impact of that capitalist system is creating an ecological problem. Yes, exactly. And and that's because what what he goes on to talk about in the in the second chapter of the of the movie, which is that our very understanding of economics and what what productivity is is flawed right so we think that productivity is about having effective machines having effective workers right and we don't consider at all the raw material aspect of that as long as we can get hold of it yeah exactly and that's that's his fundamental problem is that our our idea of productivity is based on Newtonian physics. You know, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Adam Smith at the same time, no, it's later than Newton, but but he's he's they're thinking there's the law, that's the law of the universe, right? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So Adam Smith takes that, the idea of demand and supply in the hidden hand of the market, right. is that there is only change if demand increases or supply increases or or decreases right yeah it's the same mentality and that's what governs the universe and and he's saying that's what's causing the problem both in terms of the economic productivity and who owns the economics as well as the the ecological impact so what he, what he says then is that actually what we've learned since Newton is that the laws are, that govern the universe are actually about energy and that and and he sums that up in two laws all the energy in the universe is constant so since the big bang no new energy has been created we just convert it yes true right that's the second law right so so it it might go from concentrated to dispersed ordered to disorders it might go hot cold you know it might be available might be unavailable but but essentially that's what we're playing with and his point is that is that the earth is a closed system we get energy from the sun and it's it's there if it's available for everybody but the amount of matter in, in terms of energy is fixed when the earth was created or or has evolved right right so so what we have done is created an economic system that's based on flawed principles it's based on that there is always going to be raw material available which turns out that isn't the case. <laughs> exactly. And the reason that isn't the case is that the amount of 
um, what he calls aggregate efficiency right. is the problem. So we used to think that it was about workers working more productively. We used to think it was about machines working more productively. And it turns out that the the idea of productivity is about this idea of aggregate efficiency, which is the ratio of how much um, energy or productivity we can get out of the available. So the, the example that he says is like when a lion chases down an antelope, right? right? It expends energy catching it, eating it, Right. And then it leaves the rest, but it only eats twenty percent of it, which leaves eighty percent inefficiency. Yeah. And he's saying we treat the world in the same way. Yeah. And the impact of that is we have got our idea of productivity wrong because we're losing stuff. We're not being as efficient as we think we are. And there is also a massive ecological impact as a result yeah exactly it's, it's it's similar to the idea of of uh, you producing a I, i've seen a lot of commercials where they say you need three to six liter of water to produce a plastic bottle like but in this um in the in the theory of the productivity exactly like you say they're not considering the amounts of water that is needed to produce a bubble bottle of water right right and that's the issue with beef right so beef seems to be very, um, uh, in terms of its protein value, has very high protein value and so on and so on. Yeah. But, but the amount of agriculture that's involved to feed the cows and the methane that the cows produce as a result of living makes it unsustainable. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I do remember a, a documentary about the water problem uh, in India where um, more and more companies, I, I think, I don't know, it was Nestle. Yes, it was Nestle, a documentary about Nestle, how they uh, built their um, offices and, and production facilities in India and Pakistan and whatever it was in Asia, where they would, um, where they would produce uh, their products, so Coca-Cola, whatever it was, and use all the water from the ground and exactly like Jeremy uh, uh, talks about it. It's like they didn't consider the fact that there would be an end on the supply of water. And now those towns uh, are experiencing the lack of water, <laughs> the environmental damages. That's exactly right. And, and it turns out that, you know, our aggregate efficiency, if you just think about the machines we use and the ability of the workers – is only about 20% yeah. of what makes up productivity. And the rest is the energy that's actually lost during the supply chain process of getting the raw material, transporting it to a factory, processing it, sending it on, consuming it, recycling it, or throwing it away. That's the rest. And that's why we're in such a terrible state, both in terms of productivity and also in terms of its ecological impact. Yes, exactly. And that's also what he says, the reason that the productivity isn't increasing and more declining now, uh, that the uh, majority of the developed countries have reached the limits of their productivity, which is around, I think, 20% or something. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So... I mean, so you, you're, you're, <laughs> you're faffing about with fractions of a percentage. Yeah, exactly. And actually, it's the it's the system that is a problem, and that's his point. Yeah. So, so not only is the, you know, the the model that we used in the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution flawed. It's just that you can't carry on with it. We're going to run out of materials. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with that. It's definitely there. Assuming there's there is an assumption in both industrial revolutions, where they assumed uh, unlimited availability of those raw materials, and now we're facing right the fact that it's it's gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, 
and that's his point about in the next chapter, right? Um, he proceeds uh, in his third chapter with uh, a new smart infrastructure, where is it, where he says this is the new industrial revolution where products and services are zero near zero uh, marginal costs, and the reason by that is that everything is connected. The three technologies of the third industrial revolution, also the communication, transport, and energy is going to be connected in such a way to with each other that uh, whereby it's almost it almost costs zero, uh, it's almost free to produce products and services. Right, yes. And, and he talks about like, um, he talks about uh, the problem he's, he be, began his talk uh, with was that the fact that the productivity declined the the efficiency the produ- the productivity efficiency of co- of uh, countries declined and the reason for that in this chapter he says that it's it's the fact that those um the businesses that produce products and services are plugged in the the second industrial revolution infrastructure right which is based on based on the equation where they consider unlimited availability of raw materials which factually now they're experiencing a decline in it uh, and a lot of economical uh, uh, crises we're experiencing because of that. And um, he proceeds then, uh, talks, about, uh, talks about how we can prevent that by, um, uh, with, a new, uh, the, with the new infra- infrastructure, which is the smart infrastructure where communication it's almost instantly connected globally with each other. Um, like we are doing the podcast now. You're in the UK. I'm here. We not only uh, connect it together to have a phone call, but we are looking at each other right now. We're talking with each other. We're making even a recording at the moment. And besides that, he's talking about the energy uh, that's connected uh, with each other. Now, um, more and more centralized energy companies are becoming decentralized. Yeah, where um, homeowners itself are able to produce uh, energy by itself, by themselves, and um, there is no bill from the sun. Right. There is no bill by the, <laughs> by, the pr- by the production of uh, of energy by through through the winds or through waters. Um, so there is no bill from them. Uh, therefore, it's it's much more sustainable, and um, the. And 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 this is um, and the reason that it's there is no bill from the sun or the water or the wind, whatever it is, uh, allows a country to increase their productivity eventually. Okay, yeah, yeah. So there is and, a the internet has matured. We can communicate on it. Yes, we got free energy from the sun or from the wind or you know whatever it is. Right. Although I, I must confess that. He's talking about how cheap electricity is. I, I haven't noticed my bill going down in the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> it only I can't goes up. With, <laughs> I, I, kind of, I can't agree with that. I, I definitely agree. <laughs> I can't disagree with that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the third one is that transport becomes cheaper and more efficient because you've got an AI driven transport network, right? So there's, there's either at some point we won't need people to drive stuff about, but until we don't have people driving stuff about, we can, we can avoid traffic jams and so on and so on because the system is more, more efficient, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing of this chapter is that he says that, um, the fact that all the transportation uh, will be near marginal cost because it will be autonomous, uh, energy is almost uh, 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 near marginal cost, near zero marginal cost. And so he says that these are the, basically the new three internets. Right. The internets, the three, uh, three new internets. Why it's calling, uh, calling these internets? Because he says that these are all connected with each other. Right. All the houses which produce energies can be connected to to each other. All those computers, mobile phones, production facilities, transportation, roads, whatever it is, he says it's going to be connected with each other. And that's what we are experiencing right now, he says, 
globally by the Internet of Things platform. Right. Where everything with everyone is connected through sensors with each other and where more and more companies are um, are developing products and services more efficiently whereby the aggregate efficiency, what he's talking about, is increasing because of the fact that everything is connected and they have and they are able to use the data right. to increase their efficiencies. Right. So it becomes the servitization of everything. <laughs> Basically everything, yes, yeah, servitization. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually. I, I remember the servitization talks where they, uh, I think it was Rolls-Royce, where they servitized Rolls-Royce. Yeah, it, yeah. It it cost it used to cost the motors I think I don't know billions or something. And suddenly it didn't cost for the um, uh, for the f- I don't I can't remember. It's powered by the hour, isn't it? Yeah, so now the, it's probably, the, yeah. The cost of the engine is basically included within the the hourly cost of flying, you know, the maintenance <laughs> yeah, and stuff like that. I have a old and dear friend who works for Rolls Royce. Okay. And um, the last time uh, we went out for dinner, we were talking about power by the hour. And he was like, it's a great idea, but the mentality within the organization is such that we're just not set up to deliver it efficiently. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. it's, It's such a new, you know, it's not been going long enough to to be able to learn from it. Right. So so things aren't as streamlined as they would be in 10 or 20 years down the line, right? There's just not enough data. Mm. You know, you don't know you don't know how many screws you're going to need. You don't know what service needs the engines are and so on and so on. So it's fantastic for the for the customer, but actually the internal change within the organization has a way to go in order for it to be um, as effective as, as they thought it would be. Yeah, I can imagine that because it comes down to the the people itself that has to change their thinking also. Yeah, Besides exactly. the fact that they have data to use. Yeah. yeah. And the entire um, servicing systems in different countries are, ju- are not set up that way to, to sort of document um, what the service needs are, what they need to service the problems, and so on and so on. It's it's uh, it's a different, you know. It's 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 not that the business model is flawed. It's that they're transitioning from that second industrial revolution model to the third industrial revolution model. Right. It's he said it's just very very challenging. Yeah, definitely. And the interesting, and I think uh, uh, an interesting point he makes in this, in the explanation of the third industrial revolution, the new smart infrastructure, is that he says that all these three internets, the Internet of Communication, Transport, and Energy, will be globally um, formed uh, as a network, will be a global network right. where people would have access uh, to all the data that has been generated. It will be decentralized, open, transparent, and collaborative. And he explains that the reason why everything beco- go is going towards near zero marginal cost is the fact that any entrepreneur or, or human being on earth is able to plug in onto the network and use the data to create uh, his own products or services by analytics to anal- by analyzing the data or transforming the data into products or services. So, like the initial cost, it, it definitely points out that there is an initial cost. For example, if you want to collect solar uh, solar energy, uh, but after there afterwards, after the initial uh, investment, there is almost a zero marginal cost uh, to produce new products or services. And and he does say that. Everybody underestimated the nature of digital products. So how many things could become digital? So, you know, music back in the day, right? You had to buy an LP or a cassette and then later a CD. Right. Actually, the entire 
music experience now is streamed. And what the the only bit that's missing is the live experience. At the moment, digital can't provide the same live experience as being in the front row of a gig, right? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Why? Well, I think that's the case for many uh, many industries that uh, are changed, like Netflix video industry. Yeah, like you don't have the experience anymore going to a cinema, eating popcorn, <laughs> eating some pop. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, right? I could have a better experience now if I just stuck a projector up in my my um, uh, living room, projected against a wall. I've got very tall uh, walls, very high ceilings. Right. I could easily do that. Right. I wouldn't have to cope with the queues. I wouldn't have to co- cope with the toilets. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, afford the price. You know, the price of a cinema ticket, I can't remember what it is now. It's been so long since I've been 12, 15 pounds or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's paying for at least a month of, of Netflix, Netflix <laughs> and Amazon Prime together. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Because you still you're you're essentially consuming the same experience. It's very difficult if it's a if it's a physical good, right? I mean, I think that's you know going to see a sports event or going to see a gig or something like that. Yeah, you can do it digitally, but it's not the same. Yet. No, definitely not. And I I can understand that it that the production of uh, uh, of those services uh, or products is going to near marginal cost. And I definitely agree with you that if the cost is going to zero, that doesn't mean, and if the products are being produced uh, as uh, to replace the current uh, way we are listening to music, videos, whatever it is, that doesn't mean that the experience is going to be the same or it doesn't mean that it is, there is value added on the experience itself. Right. That's ab- absolutely right, yeah. And I don't see this back in his talks. I understand that the um, it's focused uh, focused on uh, moving the economic activity, empowering the economic activity. But I'm like, okay, eventually we're doing, we're engaging with the productivity or the economic activity as human beings to in, eventually experience things and to to enjoy things. And like I understand, it's going to zero marginal cost, and that's what's not he t- what he is not talking about, but. I can imagine the uh, the new smart infrastructure he talks about gives a lot of opportunities for people who want to experiment. When 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 everything becomes new is uh, zero marginal cost, n- near zero marginal cost, then I understand. For example, let's imagine after five years, your home bill, your mortgage, your your everything becomes zero marginal cost almost, uh, and. And then, then my question, uh, the, the question I ask myself is like, okay, when I don't have to pay almost for anything to eat, to 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 get a shower or to watch TV or do whatever it is, what am I going to do? Yeah, what's the? He talks about the sort of he keeps saying a firewall crumbling, right? About the the capacity of digital to deliver or to replicate things that were physical right what he doesn't answer and it's probably unfair to (laughs) accuse him of not answering it is well where does that what are the limits of that system that new system yeah i mean he doesn't say yeah in fact he says there's nothing wrong with owning stuff there's nothing wrong with consuming stuff there is not there's not a problem the problem is the way we're doing it is fundamentally wrong it's just not sustainable right but what he doesn't explore is well where what are the limitations of the sharing economy because or or how do you transition from the second industrial revolution model to the new model. That's and he true. gets a bit confused because he says, oh, by 2050, we'll have two mature systems. You know, we will actually have 
the old model, we're still buying stuff. You know, we will still want to own stuff, but but increasingly we'll have a sharing economy. We don't want to own cars, right? We just want the ability to move around, right? And and the AI and the connected system will allow us to be able to just book an Uber or whatever it might be to get around. Right. But what he doesn't really explore is much beyond that. Yeah, because me as a person who experiments with ideas, with business ideas, I'm like, okay, thank you for this talk, Jeremy. Like, I'm excited about your idea about the smart infrastructure and Internet of Things, everything connected. I would like to start a business or I would like to explore how I can start my business based on the Internet of Things. What should I do? Right. (laughs) Should I buy this device to connect to the internet and suddenly I have data to experiment and build my (laughs) product or service? I mean, I had the same thought. It was like, so what? And I think it's partly because he writes these things to impact policy. Yeah. Not to, not to inspire entrepreneurs. Yeah. And he gives the talk to, it seems millennials and it definitely adds to the to the awareness of environmental uh, crises we have, uh, but it definitely doesn't add to okay, yeah, 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 the yeah. the action or from, for for example, what should we do? Where can we? What can we do today? Like okay, I'm going to waste. I'm going to use less plastic or bags, or I'm going to buy more green or be environmentally conscious in my uh, in my purchasing. But like. If I want to explore uh, solutions for certain problems, personal problems, business problems, whatever it is, how can I um, leverage the data of Internet of Things that you're talking about that exists right now? I suppose there has to be a tipping point, right? That, That eventually there is so much data available and we become so much better at harnessing, interpreting it, that it leads to significant innovation opportunities right so so the one i was thinking when i uh, i was listening to the talk was around healthcare so the, because because i'm working in healthcare at the moment right right and I, I was like it's funny right i you know when i exercise i wear a wristband it tells me what my heart rate is it tells me how many calories i've burned right connects to my phone I look at my phone, it tells me what that progress is over a certain amount of time. Right. But you know what? The people who really need that the, uh, are, the, are the people who work in policy and healthcare. And if they, if they had access to all of that data, oh, wow. then you would be able to start making smart decisions about what kind of investment you need in public infrastructure. And how that relates to our working habits, our eating habits, our leisure habits, how it affects our our mood, yeah, and so on and so on, right? So you would know that a certain demographic is affected by is more likely to be affected by a certain um, public health issue than another demographic. But 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 at the moment, you know, the problem I'm dealing with is the healthcare system isn't set up to do that. Well, that's an interesting point you make. I imagine, like he talks about uh, networks that is go that are going to be eventually collaborative, decentralized, open, transparent, whatever it is. Imagine, like like we have Google. Imagine a a certain uh, certain population in an area in the UK. They have a certain demographic. demographic. The demographic information you can get from the data from Google, for example, with uh, the assumption that you, they're using Google and Google uh, Gmail and so on. And they have a bank, and you can use the data from the bank to understand their purchasing or they, their spending on restaurants and so on. And you have uh, the Chamber of Commerce data to understand, to link the purchasing with the Chamber of Commerce data or to understand what types of restaurants it is. Right. And you have, I think, the healthcare system where you can link and understand more about the person. If you linked all these four, for example, systems together based on the smart infrastructure of Jeremy, I would imagine, I couldn't understand that the healthcare would get real good insights about, like you said, which demographic 
in which area, what type of age is going towards obesity, ob becoming obese, or is going to have an heart attack, whatever it is, they could probably then uh, analyze it in, in a much better way because everything is then inter connected to each other. And I think that that's his point. You know, and I, I was thinking also about the work I've done in museums, right? They're just fundamentally not interested in the data. And and I've often thought it would be a really good experiment, right? I don't know if you can even do it. Um, but presumably there are now mobile um, MRIs, right? You stick it over your head. You wander around and you can see which parts of the brain are stimulated by what. <laughs> right. Right. And it would really answer a few core questions about what people are really engaged with, what they're stimulated by, when what's the boredom threshold? <laughs> yeah. When should when should you have a participatory experience in the museum? When should you not? And so on and so on, right? Right. Just imagine having that data. Wow. And then you know, you know, if you're a teenager, then actually this kind of experience works. If you're this particular demographic, then this kind of particular experience works, and so on and so on and so on. At the moment, it's kind of guesswork. You know, with the best will in the world, it's still sort of guesswork. <laughs> I imagine. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine that. I can understand that it definitely adds value to in within the museum because if you take a. If you look at it from the perspective of experimenting in a museum, like if you put up an exhibition, put a certain uh, um, an LCD screen or something next to it with a particular information, and then like make people go to the exhibition and and measure their brain activity, and then like another day change the information on the LCD screen or present the exhibition differently and then measure the activities, brain activities eventually also, then you could understand eventually which type of act, uh, exhibition would work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what you need is, is a, yeah, is a zone where you can test those things, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you could do simple A-B testing. You, you could test, well, what's the difference between seeing something and physically handling something and so on and so on, right? I mean, that's the kind of data that you really need. Yeah. But maybe the technology isn't there and maybe the willpower isn't there in order to, you know, learn from that kind of, I suppose it's neuroeducation, right? That's really what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And imagine how, what that would be like in a school, right? If you, <laughs> if, if, if the brain was connected, but if there was a way to get that sort of data, right? I mean, in the moment, you, you, you're relying on the teacher being – who's already focused on what they're delivering, right, and then sort of looking into the whites of the eyes of the kids to see whether they're engaged or not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't do it because they're teaching 20-odd kids at once. Well, I could imagine that if there were – MRI helmets or something connected with the mobile phones of children, connected with the software of the teacher, and the fact that the majority of school systems aren't changed in the past, I don't know how many decades, <laughs> I imagine yeah. that they would, they would gain <laughs> value with insights what didn't work and what will work. <laughs> well, uh, uh, and that's exactly, the other, you know, that's the point he's making, is that you need these nodes you need the we can we can forget the communication and the and the transport and da, da 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 we just need more data otherwise we end up doing the same things just a little bit better we just update them now and then doing the same things while destroying the planet right <laughs> exactly yes so so this this also triggered me to think about apis right um, which is uh, for the listeners who don't know who, what APIs are, that those are application program interfaces, which is basically a software that allows two or more applications to talk to each other. So, so it made me think about APIs because, well, what the examples we just gave now, like if for the NHS, if they were able to to get the data from their patients uh, bank uh, um, uh, their their 
their wearables, wearables, uh, I, uh, how do you, the smartwatches, yeah, the bank smartwatches uh, and all the systems they're using, if they are able to connect them through a particular API, then they would would be able to read all those data. So, so I was Googling before our talk, like if there were, were companies who are, whom uh, are, were thinking about APIs to connect all those systems eventually and to manage, not only manage, but also generate, to collect the data. And I found not a lot of companies, to be honest. Right. There are companies creating APIs to make uh, those systems talk to each other, which is great. And uh, But I haven't seen a lot of companies who are creating platforms to enable other organizations to 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 use, build such systems, to read eventually the data of all those the several systems to understand eventually the customers. But that's, I suppose there's probably a couple of things. One is that there's a general shortage of data specialists, right? True. You know, so that kind of business intelligence. The second thing is that strategic plan that you need in order to leverage that data. That's true. You know, generally we're not as good a strategy as we think we are. Right. Right. So so we're already at a disadvantage. Then we're at another disadvantage because there's too much data. We don't know what to do with the data. We don't know how to convert the data into you know, meaningful insights. We don't know how to convert the meaningful insight into change. There's a, you know, generally innovating with inside large organizations is difficult anyway, and so on and so on. And you can see exactly the system that Rifkind has laid out, right? That <laughs> everything, every stage of that supply chain has complete inefficiencies. So that by the time you get from a good idea, it's gone through five or six channels. And actually what comes out with actually has almost zero impact. And that's what we experience on a daily basis <laughs> because there isn't that data there that convinces people or that drives the change. Yeah, that's true. I agree with that. Makes me think a lot about uh, things. Uh, it makes me, triggers me to a lot of ideas, to be honest. And in fact, if you, if you look at many of the successful startups, uh, that's a completely sweeping statement, but but they 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 make the connection between the data and the product, right? It's not just about creating a digital product to replace a physical product, although there is that, but that's easy now. It's it's how do you get the data in order to inform the development of the digital product? Yes, yes, that's that is the reason why Facebook, Google, and all those huge companies are trying to track everything and everyone because it's giving them the information to understand what the next big thing is yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. if the majority for example let's let's let's, let's uh, take uh, google as an example if millions of users of google suddenly after two months stop using google drive or gmail or google photos whatever it is and but they see an increase in one of those, and 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 it's, they see an increase in searches uh, of a specific um, software or a solution which isn't in their portfolio of products. Then I could imagine they would understand like the our customers are going from this direction towards this direction. Maybe it's it's good to buy this company <laughs> or build this product, <laughs> right? Right. So I think the 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 utility of what he's saying is really about changing your perception of the way economies can run. The way economies are managed, yes. Yeah. Well, I imagine that it definitely starts with I, I agree that it definitely starts with the human itself. And you mentioned in uh, previously that not only governments and um, institutions have to think about the smart infrastructure, but also the individuals itself, the, the small entrepreneurs. Right. They ha have to start think about the implications of this Internet of Things for them. 
because he gives also an example of I can't remember the company name, but it was a transport company uh, delivery company. He, they said we are not anymore in the delivery company. It was Daimler, right? Daimler, yeah. He, they say he he gave that example, and the company said that they're in the logistics uh, industry, where where it, the, if you as a director or the stra- on a strategy level can go towards this direction. It needs the fundamental change in your perception. Well, what they describe, or, or rather, what he describes there is the same one we studied when we did the MAN trucks. I don't know if you remember that. Mm. Back when we did servitization. Right. And they basically, you know, MAN is, is a relatively small truck company, and they were like, <laughs> we're going to get crowded out here. Right. By, by cheaper imports. Let's put sensors on everything. Oh, right. And sell. Yes haulage by the kilometer you know or haulage by the mile you know yeah exactly so what they're selling is fuel efficiency is you know security and you know uh, you know hours saved by trucks not breaking down and so on and so on yeah that's true i don't know i get triggered to another to the question whether pe- businesses are going to be forced to think about to to think about using the smart infrastructure. If if more and more laws and policies are going to be in place, which makes companies um, difficult to produce new products and services based on the infrastructure of the third and the second industrial revolution, would they be yeah. forced to think about innovation um, by being plugged on the new smart infrastructure of the third industrial revolution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that will happen. Yeah, I think so too. You know, and he does make a comment about, you know, basically, unless you make that change, you're not needed. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. If you can think of the impact of if everybody can power their own homes just through some uh, special glass is coated with a solar coating it you know absorbs power that power gets transferred into a um, battery and that's how you run your home right then then you know everything can then be generating power i mean that's that that changes it you know everything yeah that's true it changes our transport it, ch- it changes the way you live your life it changes how you work. It, and we're already at the stage, right, where you can stick, you know, you can stick solar power on your roof if you have a roof. and That's true. You know, power your house. Yeah, and it's good. It's getting also cheaper and cheaper to, to uh, the initial investment is going getting also cheaper. Yeah. And all that really needs to happen is that, there somebody can develop better battery power that's true because at the moment you you have to be plugged into the grid yeah and that power goes off to the grid essentially and comes back down again but but when you have a power a battery that allows you to store that power locally right you know within a very short time scale right power companies are are going to really struggle yeah, I don't know if they're. <laughs> I don't know. I get triggered by the by the fact by the idea that they're going to be software companies who manage all the <laughs> all the <laughs> small solar producing houses. <laughs> that's right, and they become finance companies, right? And, and, and that's where you get your battery from, right? You know. <laughs> okay. And that's you know there is a big push here in the UK about having a smart meter. It'll tell you how much energy you're using. But do you know what? I don't think people waste energy, right? You boil your kettle when you need a drink. You have a shower when you need a shower, right? So in the morning or the evening or whatever, right? Yeah. It's, I don't think many people are going to be like, i got to have a shower that lasts two minutes, you know, less than the one I had yesterday in order to save like a fraction of a kilowatt hour. Well, that's true. I recognize that by myself because 
I get it. I I got a lot of uh, offers from our our, our our city council, where they uh, where the city council said like, if you want to have solar power, we are going to finance it for you, and then you have to you are able to pay back the 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 finance without interest. Right. So like, um, and I talked with them and asked how much it will cost. They said about three and a half thousand euros. And then eventually you will be paying off uh, 25 euros a month <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of my life. And then I was like, okay, that's that's an interesting offer. Let me look how much energy I'm, I'm now spending. And it is about 25 euros a month. <laughs> 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 so the reason I haven't done it yet is because the 25 euros I'm now spending directly to the energy company is going... Uh, to the <laughs> to the city council for the next thirty years, and I think I'm not going to stay at the next uh, after thirty years still in this house. I'll probably move somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you have to do it again, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like, no, that's not interesting for me. If it, it is interesting for me, if um, I even calculated it uh, with an energy company. I said, okay, let's assume I'm going to pay the three and a half thousand euros. How much am I gaining back from the solar energy? Is it I'm going to sell it to the central, uh, uh, um, uh, centralized energy company? And they said, yeah, well, because you're living with two people you're, and, and your roof is not that big, so it's going to be difficult to get a lot of money back. You probably be even or even have to pay a bit of energy <laughs> because you're not, <laughs> not producing a lot enough. yeah right. well then i was like well, let me think about it <laughs> yeah 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 well I, and i suppose in 10 years time or 20 years time something that the efficiency solar efficiency will will increase. have increased right yeah. and 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 it'll actually be worthwhile you know yeah I mean, I, I think it's worth probably just covering off the rest of the movie. Otherwise, we just sort of um, we're just stopping it. So, I mean, what he the it's the second half that he skips over very quickly. Yeah, and he talks about how we're going to finance this, uh, and he says, "Oh, well, we'll just spend the money that we used to spend on infrastructure on new infrastructure," <laughs> and he pretty much leaves it as that. We won't let anything fall down, but we'll just invest in new stuff, right? And we, or we'll pay for it. We'll take out loans to pay for it, and we will pay it back through the efficiencies that are created through this system, right? Which is which is which is not a business case you'd ever present to the government. <laughs> but no, exactly. But you know that I suppose that I, I take his point. But the the. The next one is actually this is a means of creating massive employment opportunities. That's true. Because to upgrade the old networks, to create new networks, it needs you know people on the ground right. as well as kind of technological experts driving it. So in terms of semi-skilled and skilled work and also sort of IT-related work, then, then it is a massive driver of the economy. Right. And that's a big political problem, right? We have hollowed out the middle class. Um, we're pushing the, the unskilled workers towards zero contract hours and so on and so on. And so politicians want success stories about how to create jobs. Yeah, that's true. And I imagine this could be the reason governments would, would like this idea because one governments are now forced to go green a lot of uh, governments in uh, the developing country in developed countries so if they if, if he can present a case where there can be massive mass employments yeah then i would definitely think uh, it could be interesting for governments yeah but he does sort of say also that you know really what what is driving this is you have to develop a new new consciousness for a new era. So he talks about the, the, the shift in mentality. Right. You know, our di idea of freedom used to be, I mean, it's a very kind of American perspective, but 
people were autonomous agents, right? They they're endowed with certain rights, right. and then we are subject to uh, autonomous countries. Those countries compete for resources. It's all a zero sum game, right? That and he's saying, well, we can't carry on like that. We have to shift, and so w- what you see is actually rather than a hierarchical system. You have a flatter, uh, more inclusive, uh, lateral system where actually you you can only succeed if everybody else is also part of the same network right because we are all connected in that way we're all reliant on the same networks the same communities the same data otherwise the system um, will just revert to the industrial revolution model so the idea of community then gets updated and he's saying that's the only way we can really address that those fundamental issues that that have dominated the industrial revolution around ge- geopolitics and actually we have to th- start thinking in what what he calls a biosphere consciousness that everything that we're doing has to be informed by the fact that we have to take care of the environment right yeah i mean that, and that's where he sort of leaves it you know, there there isn't any other way. You know, we really have to resolve this, and we can't resolve it just by, like as you say, oh yeah, I need to recycle this, I need to recycle that, I need to buy responsibly. Well, for me now, it's it's difficult to understand how I understand that it can lead to a sort sort of a kind of biosphere consciousness, um, but the challenge is also to make people convince or or show people that this new smart infrastructure will add uh, positively to the environment right the link between this new smart infrastructure and the environment like bec- the reason why why i'm saying this is that if, if we need solar power more solar power winter power whatever those internet of things right building those uh, infrastructures is going to cost also a lot of fuel, fossil fuels and so on. Because you need factories still to build those Internet of Things, uh, machines and devices right. or solar panels and so on. So like, is I'm, I'm like curious whether he has researched if this um, smart infrastructure is really going to add to the environment in, in, uh, like he's talking about the aggregate efficiency. Like, uh, is it really adding to the aggregate efficiency or is it going to lower it down? Right, yeah. I, I mean, he does say that, you know, the the most um, energy-consuming things, is, you know, buildings, right, is is the is the main one, right? There's so many people. And also, I mean, I don't know what it's like where you, where you live. When I lived in London and I'd be walking around at night, I'd be like, why have all these office blocks got the lights on? <laughs> exactly to show up their offices <laughs> yeah to nobody at night <laughs> yeah exactly um so yeah so buildings right cows are the most inefficient food that you can really produce the creatures you know pound for pound you know they take so much resources in terms of water in terms of grass in terms of space and you know the methane produced and so on and so on right and then the other, the third one is transport, right? And he cites a study in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where actually, if if there was a better network, you could take eighty percent of transport off the roads, which would also reduce um, the amount of of emissions. Right. So I suppose in the in the short term, yes, you are increasing, but in the in the longer term, it it becomes a much more sustainable yeah system. I can imagine that definitely. An interesting topic, I must say. Like, I, I, I'm a person that needs the links between Internet of Things, environment, um, communicate, Internet of Communication, Internet of, of Transport and Energy to, to, uh, to understand. Maybe I have to read the book. I don't know. <laughs> to understand what he's talking about. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a YouTube video, right? I mean, it's still an investment of a good couple of hours. But it paints a picture. It tells a story. You can buy into that. I'm like you. I was like, ah, I think I need a bit more data about this in order to really 
understand it. But as a story, it's compelling enough having, you know, the way I live my life, the people that I've worked for. Right. Th there needs to be a general shift in the way politics functions. So I don't know how it is in the Netherlands, but certainly in the UK, there are many, I think, many structural issues in our politics. But above all is a lack of a plan towards the future. Oh, definitely. So the, the politics is so short term. I think there's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not really thinking about that in this way. No. And there are many reasons for that, of course. But, but above all, you know, at a policy level, we have to buy into that. And that, and that and the politics has to be networked as well, in order to ensure that actually the whole system is going going through, and that's the triumph of the EU system, right? Is that actually everybody's bought into that, and that will have impact across twenty seven nations. Similarly, in China, I think they've realised that they're not into the transparency and all that sort of stuff, but they've realised that the impact of of spewing out raw materials into the ocean and the rivers and you know the smog and so on is just not sustainable. They need to find another way to do that. Yeah, to maintain the political power and <laughs> besides, of course, acti economic activity. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he glosses over that. But fundamentally, they get it. It's just you just can't carry on. You know, it, I'm sure there must be a bunch of economists in in China going, "God, my God, the amount of raw materials we're using, yeah, that's true, is not sustainable." Yeah, this is definitely a good. Yeah, I understand. I, I agree with that. Is that definitely a good point that we are destroying the planet? Basically, we need to think about how we can stop destroying the planet and give more back to the planet while enjoying our lives yeah yeah and the current way lifestyle isn't really adding to that and like <laughs> well, but we can't we can't carry on with the mentality that it's my right to destroy the planet <laughs> <laughs> well, you know which is essentially the system we've created <laughs> that's true well the, the, exactly the point you just said about the governments you said, I don't know if it's in the Netherlands. The interesting thing is, it's like I see, for example, programs of the government. Uh, we are going to invest more uh, in solar in the Netherlands, uh, more going green, more. All, so a, a lot of programs about how in the Netherlands is going green. For example, the speed, uh, the maximum speed between 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, 5 o'clock in the evening has been uh, dec de decreased to 100 kilometers an hour. It was, used to be 130. Right. So, well, to reduce emissions, right? Yeah, to reduce emissions. But I'm like, exactly like you, like they have all those uh, different programs. And we know that governments are really bureaucratic. They're not so interconnected with each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I'm definitely also curious whether they are thinking about it, about this smart new infrastructure, about the changes we are currently uh, experiencing. Besides even Jeremy's um, thought about that this is going to be the third industrial revolution, communication change, transport and energy uh, changes. These are the changes we are experiencing right now, as he is also saying. But I don't know if those governments start thinking about that. Even I don't know if there is space within the current way of governing a country to think about those things yeah because they're so busy with the current problems for example we're in a huge pandemic yeah like if you start talking about them like hmm, maybe guys we should start monitoring uh how viruses are being spread with data <laughs> we maybe smart watches for everyone government smart watches or nhs smart watches or whatever it is i don't know if there is space and time to talk about that <laughs> What I admired was the fact that he's willing to put something on paper. That's true. That's true. And say, I've got a connected series of thoughts about the way that we manage the planet. And if you look through the comments from the video, people are genuinely inspired by that. And I think he, the point is, is actually a valid one. To, to make better decisions, you need more data. And the type of decisions we have to make are those around 
our environment and those are about how we choose to invest scarce economic or human resources into an activity. Right. So there can't be any other way. Yeah. But he just glosses over the sort of impacts, the negatives, you know, the, you know, what, what, who's controlling this data and what happens if terrorists get hold of this data and so on and so on and so on, you know. I agree. But I suppose, but, but at least he's putting it out there. And just from our, you know, quick conversation today, we've identified half a dozen places where you could actually make a difference if things were connected. Definitely. Yeah, I agree with that. It definitely makes people think more consciously about how our current lifestyle is damaging the environment. And that's a good start to make cheap people change and eventually even uh, starting a conversation about the smart infrastructure and even saying like, yes, I agree with you. That's that's the win, I think, also. Making people understand and accept the fact that we are, our lifestyles are damaging the environment. And eventually, if we, whatever solution we are going to, cho uh, to choose, whether it's the smart infrastructure of Jeremy or another solution by another economist, that's a good discussion to have. But yeah, it starts yeah. with accepting the fact that we're going downwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and also the fact that, you know, he's making a relatively good story out of the fact that economic growth in the past came from these three particular drivers around communication, around transport, around what powers those things. Right. And so the, the lesson is there. Yeah. You know, you can power growth in the economy through these yeah. things. Whether governments are willing to do that, buy into it, you know, well, that's something else. But that that's, you know, the, the green revolution and all that sort of stuff is coming from this kind of thinking. It is to influence policy people. By convincing them in the, in the beginning, like, your current policies are destroying the planet, right? <laughs> and they're like, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's your responsibility to do something about it, you know. Nobody has a plan and so on and so on. Yes. You know? Yeah. And I imagine why, I can imagine that, the, the, for example, he gives a lot of examples of Angela Merkel and uh, uh, and that's the, that premier of, uh, of China who listen mm. to him and eventually use his book in their policies. So I can't imagine they are convinced of the fact that their policies are destroying the planet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and like they would choose like, okay, Jeremy, let's use your model to <laughs> go towards another direction as a, as a starting solution. Yeah. Eventually, maybe it can change towards another idea from someone else. But it's good that China and Germany he gives us an example, so already accepted the fact that they're destroying the planet and they need to do something else about it. And if you think about the last time we talked, we talked about creative destruction. Yeah. Schumpeter's idea of creative destruction and the fact that there are positives. It creates a new long wave, creates jobs, creates economic activity. And this week we've talked about uh, Rifkin. Right. And if you're a politician or you're working in policy, and I came to you and said, do you want creative destruction or do you want this plan by Jeremy Rifkin? Which would you choose? Jeremy Rifkin. Right. Yeah. But essentially they're the same thing. Yeah. It's also, yeah, the creative destruction is talking also about cycles. It's going to end. <laughs> is what he is offering an updated version of Schumpeter? You started this, in the, in the, I don't know if it was in the beginning of this talk or, or before the, our, uh, our recording, you talked about the, it's, uh, about the long cycle. It could be a long cycle. Jeremy has, uh, Jeremy's idea could be a long cycle of the creative destruction Schumpet is talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you look at those previous industrial revolutions, those could be the previous cycles. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, definitely similar to each other. Yeah. The, re the reason I would choose it is purely because of the data. Like doing something with all the available data and systems we have now, trying to connect them to understand right. how to um, improve the lives 
of 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 the population in a certain area, whatever it is, that would be the reason for me to choose for Jeremy Rifkin. Right. It's it's I maybe I don't know certain ideas of of him. I can't grasp um, practically what it what it would mean to do. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would I definitely see value in the in the in, in the data idea of his that big data can help us improve yeah. our life. And you know if you if you think about the you know there's usually five questions when you're designing strategy. So it's you know what's the ambition, you know where you where are you playing, how are you winning, what's the competencies you need, what's the resources you need. Right. This book is just about the first three. Right. It's like, what's the big idea? We've got to save the planet. You know, <laughs> where, where, <laughs> where, where are you playing? Oh, these three particular areas. Well, how are you going to win? We're going to harness the power of data in order to, you know, leverage growth. Yes. Through clean networks. And the next uh, two questions were? Oh, it's like, what management competencies do you need to do that? We need IT people. And what other resources <laughs> do you need? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. It's in Laughley and whatever. Right. You know, I don't know how long I did like two units of strategy and I should have just read this <laughs> book by Laughley right at the start. <laughs> right. Because the way we were taught strategy, right, was there's only one winning idea. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> really statically. <laughs> this is the one winning idea done. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and Laughley's saying there are multiple ideas what you need is to develop multiple ideas and then is this the one that's going to help us win? Should you do it? But you summarized it's very uh, good. You said it's about saving the planet um, and looking through the communication, mobility and energy and data is going to give us uh, the opportunity to, to try to save the planet through communication, energy and transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right, yeah. That's basically the summary, I think. And like afterwards, of course, talking about yeah, who's going to finance it? How are we going to finance it? And when and why? And the pl the, the the plan itself. Hmm. So, would you recommend this one then? Definitely recommend uh, to anyone who cares about the planet, <laughs> <laughs> which should be all of us, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah. true <laughs> yeah but we yeah. will drop links of course so you can watch it yourself hi Alex here I'm back to close out this episode of the Innovation Book Club with a few prompts and questions to take your learning further before we start, however, here's a quick note about why we're actually doing this. We believe that the value of learning is not in knowledge acquisition. Its value lies in the reflection process. When you judge the value of the knowledge that you've been exposed to, you understand how that analysis changes your view of the world, and then ultimately how that knowledge and understanding increases both your capacity and capability to engage with and shape the world around you. So to that end, what we've done is we've come up with a few questions to help you reflect on what you've just heard and to try and push you on with your own innovation learning journey. So here they are. Number one, Rifkind makes the case that the synergies created by innovations in energy, connectivity and transport powered previous industrial revolutions, created economic development, and generated jobs. How convinced are you by his arguments? Number two, Rifkin's ideas about a green revolution and a distributed economy powered by renewable energy, the Internet of Things, and connected transport networks are presented as the key way to generate economic growth in the future. But what else would need to change for his ideas to succeed. Number three, what areas of your work would be improved if Rifkin's ideas were adopted by your company? These questions are also in the podcast notes together with additional links if you'd like to read or watch something else related to this episode. 
good luck with your answers and let us know how you get on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Innovation Book Club. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can do three things to help us grow our audience. First of all, please leave us a five-star review on your podcatcher of choice. This helps to feed the algorithm. Second, share this episode with your friends and colleagues if you think they would benefit. And finally, if you'd like to listen to all future episodes of the Innovation Book Club as soon as they're available, then please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, take care and we'll be back soon.